How does the professionalization of community work contribute to the breakdown of community? All kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. One is, I think, that professionals and agencies are always setting the agenda. So they have the staff, the time, the resources to call meetings, to do planning. So they're always planning and meeting around what's important to them. It leaves very little time for the community to plan around what's important to them. We've got more and more professionals doing for communities what they used to do for themselves. So it leaves very little space for a community to do, to do their action. Um, we've got, um, I talked about the siloing and about how agencies have organized us into so many different silos. And, we, and they're all competing for our attention. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of agencies trying to get our attention around their agenda. So we all get split up in different directions when in reality it should all come together in a place. Right? Um, those are few. I could go on and on and on on that one. And again, great people. It's just sort of that's the nature of the beast. So I, and I really believe in government and nonprofit organizations. So I think the challenge is how do we get the best of both worlds? How do we get that expertise and those resources from agencies combined with the expertise and resources from the community to come together for the best possible solutions? If you think about it, I currently live on an island just off of uh, Seattle. Uh, Vashon Island. We have no local government, very few agencies. I've never had a stronger sense of community because everybody just rolls up their sleeves and does it because there's nobody else. And I find that in rural areas. you got the strongest sense of community because there's nobody else to do it. So how do we do that in an urban context and take advantage of these fantastic resources we have? Because people in the bureaucracy absolutely care about community. That's why they're doing their jobs. And they're often as frustrated with the bureaucracy as the citizens are. And so that's why my passion is about how to get change on both sides so we can get the best of agency, best of professionals, and the best of community for the best possible outcomes for everybody. Since you're in the elections for the mayor of the city, how, what suggestions could you give us? How can we entice? <laughs> Vote for somebody. No. <laughs> um, yeah, it was funny. I would tell people, I was in Calgary the night of the elections with a lot of immigrant friends. And I was just, that was the night everybody was so excited about who they elected in Calgary. And then I saw who you were. It was just like she was so much um, I, I think being involved in elections is tough for neighborhood associations. That's always a hard one. Because you, you don't want to be political in the sense of uh, neighborhood associations picking candidates because you want to make sure your organization is open to everybody of all political persuasion. One of the things we did in Seattle several years ago is we just created an organization called Vision Seattle. This was actually 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and it really helped lead to some of the change. And it brought together neighborhood associations uh, and nonprofit organizations. And basically what they did is said, this is what's important to us. These are our values. These are our priorities around particular issues. And we will support the candidate who align with those values. And that worked really well. So we can start now, like two years before the yeah, election. Yeah, you know, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work, but it's hard. It's hard work to put it together. And you know, sometimes those issues that um, divide, are, there's no clear neighborhood position either. Like you know, in Seattle, one time, the big issue was monorail. Do we have monorail or not? Should we have the viaduct above ground or underground? There were deeply divided opinions, but it wasn't like there was a neighborhood position and an anti-neighborhood position. You know, people were divided. So it's, it's tough. It's tough, but I think you can sort of have those overall goals. And I would suggest one of them is do they see active communities as a strength? So many local governments, their whole sole focus is, you know, especially in tough times, the focus is on the fiscal infrastructure, public safety, back to basics. What's more basic than democracy? What is more basic than strong communities and strong neighborhoods? and making sure that's part of their platform, they're speaking to it. And I say that stuff should cut across the political spectrum. Everybody should, everybody should get behind that. But they don't, unless they get pressure. They're hearing a lot from developers, but not much from neighborhood people. And the other thing I'd say is that oftentimes we work hard for a candidate, and then once they get in office, we figure we either won or we lost, and we go back home. That's just when the corporations go to work. They don't give up on anybody. 
They work over who's ever in office, and we should do the same, hold them accountable once they're in, no matter who it is. I just tend to believe it's, lit, it's, it's more important to be organized in our communities than actually who's elected. Because you can, you can change just about anybody if you got enough people with you. I've been really just, I, you know, I worked really hard for Barack Obama, but I was sure disappointed in a lot of things he's done around Syria, around bailout of the banks, right? And he taught that every major social change comes bottom up. That's what he learned from community organizing. He just reinforced it over and over and over again. Seattle have any special Good Samaritan laws or, I mean, one of the problems with people trying to, you know, fix a park or a playground is who's going to get sued, is going to get hurt, or, yeah, yeah. or even TV guards? That's the thing that stops projects everywhere. Every city I go to, there are neighborhood groups that want to come together and create a community garden, fix up a vacant lot, do, do something cool for their community, and they're told, they get to the bureaucracy and they're told all the reasons why it can't happen. So when we started the matching fund, I went to the head of our parks department because I knew that a lot of people would be interested in parks projects and I figured they'd lend themselves well to volunteer labor. I said, great news, we're gonna have a matching fund. We're gonna get all kinds of volunteers, building new parks, new playgrounds, it's gonna be great. Oh no, <laughs> we don't want people messing with our parks. <laughs> I sort of bit my tongue and wondered whose parks are they? But she had very legitimate concerns. Those are all legitimate around uh, liability health and safety, who's gonna maintain them, union issues, how are we gonna, Jim, you're saying, let's, let's, let's um, let any group of neighbors come together to do a project, we can't legally do that because they aren't incorporated, they don't have nonprofit status. Those are all the reasons, the excuses for saying no to projects everywhere in the world. Every bureaucracy is the same. I got the same thing when I was in China, in Beijing. So the biggest value of the matching fund is we figured out how to cut through that and say yes. So what we do is we team up a group of neighbors with a nonprofit that can serve as the fiscal agent and handle the money. The, the, the nonprofit usually has liability insurance, so the group's covered during the construction process. If they aren't, we use some of the matching funds to cover the liability insurance. When our, our city is self-insured, so we just need to make the pro sure the project's built to the standards of that department. So we require pre-application, so the department reviews the pre-application against their safety standards, against the budget, lots of technical review, gives that feedback back to the applicant, so when they write their final application, hopefully it can be signed off by the department. Because if it isn't signed off by the department, we won't give it to the citizen review group. And then uh, we work out a maintenance agreement before we sign the contract. Usually it's a fight over who gets to maintain it, right? Because the community's put so much work into it, they're pretty determined. But if, you know, if there's existing workforce taking care, if it's an existing park, then it's usually the parks department because we don't want to put anybody out of a job. Um, yeah, so I think those were the, the key things. So we just figured out how to cut through that red tape. That's really the best value of the matching fund. Can you talk a little bit about how to do, uh, how to work in environmental inequality? Oh boy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think a couple things. One is, um, a couple things. One is, I've talked a lot about sort of asset-based approaches to the community work. I also very much believe in organizing for social justice. I think too often times we start with the rights and we start with social justice without having done the community building work. So it just becomes nonprofits advocating for a certain portion of the community or a few individuals advocating for themselves. And what we need to do is build a much broader movement. And I'm really convinced we need to use all the calls in order to build that movement. And then we don't have to yell so loud, because we've got a real voice. Second thing is we need to build more inclusive communities so that we start to build those relationships, start understanding each other's plights, to start understanding one another. I have a friend in Ames, Iowa, who started up a project called Beyond Poverty. And she recognizes that everybody's got poverty in their life. For some people, poverty is a lack of money, and for other people, poverty is a lack of meaning and relationships. And that oftentimes the people with the most money have the least meaning and the fewest relationships. So she brings people together across class to help each other with their poverty. So in everything we do, we try to deal with those issues of try to encourage diversity. So so our matching fund criteria, about half of them are standard grant writing criteria, but the other half are all about participation 
including to what extent it's a project reflects the diversity of the people in your neighborhood. We will not give money to a neighborhood. They can hire their own planner, independent of the city, but we will not give money to a neighborhood until all of the stakeholders are at the table, particularly the people who haven't been involved in the past. We provide lots of tools to community groups to help engage with translation, interpretation. Oftentimes we have high expectations on people about being inclusive, but we don't give them the tools to do it. We do things like create district councils to bring all the different associations together so they can start to meet each other, to start building relationships, develop consensus, develop a common vision. Because most neighborhood associations just don't have that, those kind of resources to connect with everybody. Um, we always try to encourage connections across neighborhoods as well. So we have a city neighborhood council that brings all the neighborhoods together. Um, a whole variety of strategies, but uh, it's a, it is a growing issue. Well, I can get going on gentrification. So I think gentrification is a huge issue. And oftentimes, like in Columbus City, where people worked really hard to make their neighborhood a better place, it started to gentrify a little bit. And that's kind of the nature of capitalism, right? You improve the value of a place, and it costs more money. Common sense. There's a great way of dealing with it, but there's one way of dealing with gentrification, which is let's bring back all the substandard housing, Let's bring back all the trash. Let's bring back the crime. And it'll become ungentrified. Yay! <laughs> I think, again, too often times we deal with gentrification in a siloed way, where it's just about how do we keep those poor people in our neighborhood? And that should not be the goal. The goal should be, as our economy improves, how do we make sure that the people who are on the lowest end of the economic spectrum benefit from that? How do we create living wage jobs? Right? How do we build businesses, small businesses, around the assets of the community? How do we create new models of housing, co-housing? So it, you know, it, it has to do with our schools. We need to take a much more both and prong strategy. And again, too often times the strategy coming out of just agencies is very narrow. there was a formula there is no formula um, each that's the beauty of neighborhoods and communities each one's different and that's the problem I think often with bureaucracy is they try to treat everybody the same and it doesn't respect what's unique about each culture in each place there are some general rules some principles some tools that work so my book is one source you can use there's some great books on asset-based community development. Uh, my friend Mike Green wrote a great book, When People Care Enough to Act, put out by Inclusion Press, about kind of organizing in an asset-based community development way. Um, there's some great books on community organizing, um, uh, Tools for Radical Democracy is one. Uh, there's all kinds of tools, um, but uh, you know, the best thing is just to get a, a sense of some of the key principles, some of the key tools, and then start doing it and saying what works in your community. I, you know, I do two-day workshops on all this stuff, so it takes a while. But things like, I really believe in open space is a way to get people to take some responsibility, take immediate action. I love visioning because people come together around their vision for the community. You can do it in, in, in an evening rather than planning for years. I like time banks. Those are a great way to connect people in community. There are lots of tools. Uh, and then some of the principles I just shared tonight I think are really could be helpful. And then I have a whole set of other kind of principles for agencies and how to work effectively with the community. Um, so you could, you know, those books. And I put my email up here. So if you have specific questions, just let me know and I'll try to find the resources. Or if you have a story you want to share, questions. I'm absolutely passionate about making change, about building community. And, Thank you.
quick as you can listen to me rant for the last couple hours. So um, this is this is the place I like to be. I like to be among people who want to make change, who are equally passionate about community. So if there's anything I can do to help, and I also just get inspired by people like you. So thanks so much. Appreciate it.